Amen. Good to have you all here. Thanks for weathering the, the weather. Um, I'm sorry if you came here hoping to get on the ark. The ark isn't, isn't totally built yet. We hope to have it ready by yesterday, but I think we missed our window to get out of town. So, so, uh, so, but we do have a few animals running around out there. I got a few squirrels that we've got captured to go on the ark. Um, when we lost our daughter eight years ago, eight and a half years ago, um, pictures became exceptionally important to us. We had um, a plethora of pictures because um, we have these things now. And so we have a camera with us all the time. And, um, and so they be, you know, I, go through, I go through Facebook, Facebook memories and I see pictures that I, and I save them. Sometimes I've saved the same picture a dozen times. They just keep reappearing up through my photos. I just keep saving them because I want them to go down the list so I see them more and things, things like that. And oftentimes I thought about where we would be like 200 years ago when they didn't have pictures. And you said goodbye to somebody and that was it. That was the last time you'd see their image again and how um, hollow that would be and how difficult that would be. So pictures are something that brings a sweet remembrance to us, but they're also, um, I'd rather have my daughter back than just have a picture. You see, so I have a picture of something I want to show you that it is exceptionally beautiful. Some might call it art, and uh, but I'll let you determine that. I'd call it art. Jay, if you want to put that picture up, that'd be that'd be great. There it is. <laughs> Look at that. Just just marvel at it. <laughs> Look at the pepperoni. The pepperoni is like perfectly spaced. The the cheese is beautifully melted, browned around the edge, not even cut yet, right out of the oven. Smell. You can't smell it though, can you? You know, when I saw that picture earlier, I, I was so hungry because pizza is my favorite food. I think it's going to be the food of heaven. Um, some believe that is manna right there. That that's what manna was, pepperoni manna. And um, and so I tried to take a bite out of the screen, but it didn't taste good at all. The the the, the cheese wasn't melted on the screen or anything like that. So so it was it was it, because it was one dimension. It's beautiful. We can keep that up for a little bit. It looks so good. As long as I look at the picture, I don't get carbs. I know carbs in that. I, um, I can't smell it. I can't hold it. I can't taste it. It's just an image. But the rest is up to my imagination. I want to speak today about a, a discipleship. You can take it down now, Jay. We, um, it's beautiful to say goodbye. But I'll send you that picture in the mail if you want it. You can put it on your wall or something like that. Um, I want to talk about discipleship. Because pictures are one-dimensional. I mean, they give us an image, but you can't experience them. You can use your imagination, which is very um, a gift from God. Imagination is a gift from God. I can imagine eating it, but I don't get the satisfaction of eating it. I can imagine what it tastes like with a Diet Coke, but, um, but I, I don't, I, all, all it is is an image to me. Well, when we talk about discipleship, um, I think what happens, discipleship in, in church culture today has been morphed down into one dimension. We, we have a list of things to do that we, we are allowed to declare disi we're disciples. We are here to say, I'm discipling somebody, or I'm being discipled. I'm part of the disciples, a discipleship group. Well, what does that mean, though, exactly? Does it mean that I get a booklet and I have a fill-in-the-blank answers on it and I go through a book and I read it and I fill in the answers? And, and um, there's nothing wrong with that. I, that's, that's, that's educational. That um, helps steer my brain right. But is, isn't, it isn't necessarily guaranteeing any real heart change, is it? See, those are things that's intangible. So discipleship isn't, can't be found in a curriculum. It can't be found in, in um, somebody's relationship with somebody else. Paul, who was the master of discipleship um, um, man, just said, basically, be followers of me. Watch how I live my life, and so you'll see what a disciple looks like if you see how I live my life. So what I want to do today, I want to do everything. I want to give you today exactly what I don't want to give you. I want to give you a snapshot of discipleship because I can't make it three-dimensional for you. I can only give you one dimension. I can give you the ingredients of it. 
how it sort of works, the key things that we put in place to allow the Holy Spirit to disciple us and transform us into his image. But when it comes outside of that, outside of giving you the snapshot of it, discipleship is something that is deeply personal between you and God. So if you want to take a one dimension concept of discipleship, like the piece of pizza, that's one dimension. If you want to experience all three dimensions of that pizza, you got to go buy one. Seven bucks, Howard Howie's, Hungry Howie's, get the garlic crust. And, um, and, um, and, and, and then, then you can actually partake of the, um, the three-dimensional pizza. So let's look at what, it's, what a disciple looks like. Now, I, I have a three or four things that I'm going to talk about. Trust me, these can be broken down into categories, subcategories. And I, I hate formulas because formulas are different for everybody. Okay, but I'm just I'm sort of bringing into um, hopefully focus on what I feel like has made a difference in my life and has allowed me to become more like Christ over the last 40 years of walking with him or so. Webster's defines discipleship this way. This is the old Webster's, 1800 Webster. A follower, an adherent to the doctrines of another, of course, that'd be Jesus Christ. Hence, the constant attendance of Christ were called as disciples, and hence all Christians are called as disciples as they profess to learn and receive his doctrines and precepts. Now, that's a great snapshot, but have you, um, do you think that all Christians are disciples? Uh, I would answer that probably no, um, because all Christians are at different places. Could I be a born-again Christian for three days and be classified as a disciple? Absolutely. Could I be a born-again Christian for 40 years and be classified as a disciple? Absolutely. I could be a born-again Christian for 40 years and not really be a disciple. Just as easy. And I'm going to show you sort of why. The word um, discipleship, is manthanos, the biblical word. It's an old word that means a learner. Oh, you have it on the screen. A learner or a student. Vital to understand. This is where manthanos loses some of its um, interpretive power. People don't see this part of it. But it goes beyond the simple definition that I, a a snapshot, one-dimensional snapshot definition. A discipleship not only reflects the teaching of his master, but also his character and nature. And that's very important. See, I can come to a grace-based church and hear message after message of the grace of God being preached, but if I'm not gracious, if I don't give people grace, if I don't receive grace, if I don't let grace permeate my life, then grace has not really discipled me, has it? Because it... I, I reflect the character and nature. So not only do I take the teachings of Jesus Christ and, and, I, and I try to guide my life around the teachings of Jesus Christ and his apostles and his disciples in the epistles, but I also want to reflect the character and nature of Jesus Christ, which we see screaming off the pages of the New Testament. In Mark 9, he touched the leper. See, that's three dimension. Jesus doesn't say, I have compassion on you. This, in, this infectious, non-curable disease of the age. He touched the leper. He goes, I'll pray for you as long as it doesn't cost me anything. No, no, it costs him. He has to touch him. Then he has to be, by Jewish law, Jesus needed to be quarantined and checked by the priests and everything else because he became infectious and unclean by Jewish law at the same time. But Jesus was three-dimensional. He wasn't just a snapshot. He was a real person with a real heart and a real ministry from God. Let's read Matthew 28, um, 18 through 20. And Jesus said to them, this is his last scene on earth, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. 
So before we can make disciples, it's important that we are a disciple. You know what I mean? Um, I, if I'm going to reproduce myself, then I have to be something to be reproduced. So I'm going to give you these checklists here, and, um, and you can just see um, how, and we're all at different places here, but these are things I see, um, these snapshots, these one-dimensional snapshots of what it takes to become a three-dimensional disciple. The first is a, a conscious, full surrender to God. <clears throat> now this is easier said than done, and this comes, probably comes in layers. When I became a new Christian, I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. And I did. To the best of my ability, I gave everything in my life to Jesus Christ. But I was wrong. Because I found out 40 years later that there's so many more things in my life I haven't given to Jesus Christ. He's still showing me things, which I'm keeping in myself. I'm keeping in my back pocket. He's showing me my insecurities, my fears, my secret wants, my desires, and all these things, which, which um, I thought weren't even on my radar screen 40 years ago when I was 19 years old, however long that was. See, so this conscious surrender is something as God reveals things to me throughout my Christian walk, then I, I bring that under his governorship, whether it's my woundedness or whatever it is. I love this in 1 Chronicles 28 verse 9. A lot of verses um, um, talk about this whole heart covenant with God. And it's God talking to Solomon. And you, Solomon, my son, know the God of your father and serve him. This is David talking to Solomon. Um, serve him with a whole heart and with, a, and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands every plan and thought. If you seek him, he'll be found by you. But if you forsake him, he'll cast you off ever. Of course, we, we know under grace that's not. Am I? Just, okay, I'm breaking, busting up again. So, um, so we seek him with a willing heart. Willing mind, it's a, a mind that takes delight in and pleasure in. Now look what he says. He says, God searches the hearts and understands every plan and every thought. Do I understand every plan and every thought? No. I promise if you thought I did, you way overestimated me. No. No. I, I, I don't have a clue. I mean, sometimes people look at me for wisdom. I'm like, oh. I don't know what to do. And I don't have any problem telling anyone that. Pastor Kelly, what's your wisdom on that? Eh, void, none. <laughs> I don't have any. <laughs> but what's, what happens more than, more than anything else is God shows me these things about me. I get bugged by something. Something irks me or bugs me or hurts me or wounds me. And I'm wondering, what, and I'm, I, sometimes I don't even wonder it. I just look at the person responsible for it, and I, and I judge them spiritually. Oh, God, I know that you must be as disappointed with them as I am. <laughs> and all the time, God's like, maybe God's absolutely dealing with their life, but all the time, God's knocking on the door of my heart saying, Tim, I'm trying to heal something in you and fix something in you. Next week, we're going to talk about hope, and um, that... that, that you have misconstrued and misplaced. So will you surrender that to me? Surrender is an inward act that works its way to the outward man and outward acts. It's putting Christ to the best of our ability um, in a place of preeminence in all areas. Externally, with what we do with our, our hands and our feet and our mouth. And internally, this is the, this is the more difficult part what we do with our inner life some may say yes Jesus is the Lord of my life but let me ask some hard questions is he the Lord of your money Ooh, Pastor Kelly can I say something to you from the bottom of my heart what's that shut up <laughs> is he a Lord of my time Or do I go to a beach on a Sunday morning? <laughs> I'm saying that because two people went to the beach last Sunday morning and they're listening. <laughs> so I'm just picking on them. 
I don't care that he went to the beach, I'm just saying. Is he a Lord over my time? Have I, have I surrendered my marriage to the Lord? Have I surrendered my kids to the Lord? Now here's a trickier one. Have I surrendered my wounds? Pain for my past to the Lord? Have I surrendered my resentments? That we probably all have had or have currently to the Lord. Have I surrendered my bitterness? To the Lord. And this is why some will never get delivered from their past. We talked about a lot about this recently. We're going to be talking about this on, on sound bites, our little uh, four minute thing we do during the week. Some will never get delivered from their past because they've never been delivered from themselves. They, they'll grind their teeth over something that happened in the past or something that's some infraction about them, somebody who sinned against them. Legitimate as it may be, they may, may be a legitimate victim. And all the times God's saying, I, I, want, I want to bring you to something where you can relinquish this and do something more profound in your life. I'll work on those people. Don't worry, I'm the God of justice. I know how to meet things out. I know how to uh, fix things and balance the, the scales. I know how to do all that. That's not your job. That's my job. So will you let me do that and just get to know me? Have I surrendered myself to the plan of God? Whatever that may be, that may be the hardest part of all. I've shared the story so many times when we lost Hannah and I, about a month in, I surrendered the loss to my, to my daughter, of my daughter to God. I said, God, okay, God, this is your will. I don't like it, but this is your will. And then, then about an hour later, I, I, I would unsurrender it. <laughs> then I'd surrender it to God again. About another hour later, I'd unsurrender it. It took me about five years to let God really minister to me there and keep it surrendered to him. So we have, we surrendered ourselves to the plan of God. Are you okay? This is a big one. This is something I've seen a lot recently. Are you okay with God using you like he wants to use you and not how you think you're to be used? I have a lot of folks say to me, I have these gifts. I want God to use these gifts. Okay. Can you trust God to use those gifts? In the timing that God wants to use those gifts? How God wants to use those gifts? Many times I believe that's born out of a subtle dissatisfaction with our life as it is right now. And like we said a few weeks ago, um, God doesn't want it, anything, doesn't need to change one thing in our life to give us deep satisfaction and deep contentment and, and deep at be, being at peace with ourselves. It doesn't have to change one thing. There's nothing externally needs to be changed. It's just me and Jesus Christ and the internal parts of my heart. God may use your gifts. He may use them for a period of time. He may not. What happens if I'm in the bed of affliction and I can't be used? What happens if I have a disease or a sickness and I can't be used like I used to be? Does that mean my life has no value or no purpose? No, of course not. It's just as much purpose as I have preaching the gospel. This is what God asked me to do. I have no more purpose, greater purpose than anyone sitting here or anyone listening. Just find Christ in your life now. He'll use your gifts. There's no greener pasture. There's no promised land. The promised land happened when Jesus died on a cross and he gave us his Holy Spirit. The promised land is in here until we actually go there at death. Oswald Chambers says this great quote, the passion of Christianity comes from deliberately signing away my own rights and becoming a bondservant of Jesus Christ. Until I do that, I will not begin to be a saint. He never minces words. <laughs> there is no real discipleship without consistent surrender. I can go to church for 50 years and never truly be conformed to the image of Christ. The next thing we do after a conscious surrender, we learn of him. Take my yoke upon me, learn of me, for I'm meek 
and lowly in heart, and you, and you shall find rest unto your souls. Again, just to reiterate, I'm giving you snapshots, one-dimensional. These things need to become real personally for me and for you. Um, this learning of him without inner transformation just makes you a database. It makes you full of information, but the information is detached from the life behind the information. We learn of his teaching, we learn of his values, we learn of his doctrines. The world, more than ever, my friends, wants to know how we think. They want answers to the many questions that are everywhere. Has anyone noticed there's a lot of people bickering lately? Just, just turn on the news for four seconds <laughs> and you'll see it. Anyone says anything that uh, disagrees with somebody else, they're hate mongers and they're blasting on the media and this one comes out against this one and that one comes out against that one and this one comes out against that one and nobody has a right to think. Everyone needs to think exactly the same way but unfortunately it doesn't work that way. Where's the church in all this? I'm not criticizing the church but do we have answers? I'm not saying political answers. I'm saying biblical answers. First Peter 3.15. But sanctify the Lord, the Christ in your hearts, and be always prepared to give an answer to everyone that asks you to give an account of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Great verse. So I have to equip myself to give that answer so I can show people the hope that I have. Now, there are enough tools and information available to every believer today, more than ever. You don't have to go to seminary. You don't have to go to Bible college to learn. There's so much learning out there. So many things, the basic questions the world has about our faith. I had somebody um, I, I deeply respect and um, for successful, and they had, they had a, a real question about what happens to me when I die? Because they're facing things in their life that um, they're going to die in the next 10 years. <laughs> what happens to me when I die? Legitimate question. Well, I could say, well, you go to heaven. Well, how do I know that? And then they may say, I say, well, you believe on Jesus. Okay. Why should I believe in Jesus? Why can't I believe in Buddha? Why doesn't my good works get me there? I've been a good person. I, and so that conversation goes deeper and deeper. Do I have answers for that? Guess what the apostle's talking about here? We need a well-thought-out faith. Why do we believe what we believe? I shared this story many times. My secretary of my first, my first 10 years really as a pastor um, who's with Jesus now, and, she, and um, um, she's the same secretary that I asked to brew a pot of coffee, and she brew espresso. And, um, and so I was drinking espresso all day. My heart rate went up to 230 or something like that because I, I had no idea that she had given me caffeinated espresso. I just kept drinking it. Well, that was really strong. <laughs> I just kept on drinking it. <laughs> anyway, she's in heaven now. She's right with God. God didn't bring her there because of that. But this is, she had, she had, um, she went home one day and she had a neighbor and the neighbor knocked on her door um, and the neighbor was a Jehovah Witness. She let the neighbor come in, and they talked, and, and um, two hours later, the neighbor left, and she called me crying. She goes, I don't know what I believe anymore. Um, I, she makes me believe that Jesus isn't really the son of God. He says a creation of God. He goes, I don't know what to think anymore. She seemed pretty convincing to me. And I drove over to her house. I spent two hours with her detangling what this particular Jehovah Witness had to say to her. My, now, my question was, here's my secretary that worked with me closely for a decade, and she couldn't defend the deity of Jesus Christ even on, a, on an elementary level. Am I ready to give an answer of the hope that's inside of me? 
See, that information isn't supposed to be just exclusive to guys like me who go to school and teach and preach and get pieces of paper on our wall. It's available for every believer. You don't have to know everything, but we should know something. <laughs> we should be able to answer the basic questions of the faith so we can, we can give that answer um, um, when that opportunity, uh, God gives us the opportunity to give that answer. See, I believe in friendship evangelism. I believe in servant evangelism. We'll talk about that a little bit more. But at some point, there has to be confrontational evangelism where somebody is confronted with the gospel. Salvation doesn't happen through osmosis. It happens by a decision that people make. All right, Pastor, you, you, um, you're getting me. I'm a little convicted here. How do I just learn the basics? Well, we have these classes every week that, that are the basics, and we can, we can even tailor make those, and once we go through some of the books and maybe do more specific things and things like that. But there's so many good resources out there. That I use something called eSword. It's a free Bible software, amazing access to um, all sorts of free material and very easy interface to use. It takes you about a couple hours to set it up on your laptop or iPad, but I've been using, I have a library full of books and, um, and I find myself spending more time in these. It's free. Inductive Bible study. There's somebody out there, there's a professor out there that's available online 24-7. His name is Dr. Google. <laughs> Just Google him. And uh, Google these questions. Now, you may find all sorts of diverse answers, but I use Dr. Google a lot. Sometimes I'll be asked a question, go, I don't really know that. Dr. Google, blink, blink, and there it is. Boy, Pastor Kelly, you know a lot. Well, you know, you know, it's just a gift from God. I can't take credit for it. <laughs> no, it's Dr. Google got me, got me the answer because I can't, we don't know everything. But we have to understand as the church, they're going to ask us questions. They're not going to blindly believe. They're not going to just believe because we tell them to believe. They've, they're going to believe because they realize we have an answer to their questions. And the world is questioning more than they ever have before. Let me read you this um, long quote by Redpath, and we'll get on um, to the next point in a moment. The hope of our day is a militant church totally abandoned to the will of God, for I believe there is that one day every one of us will be held accountable before God as to how we have or have not met the challenge of our day. Whether or not we have lived our lives on such a level that we are totally available for God's holy purposes. This is written in the 40s or the 50s. If God does not find his church if God does not find in his church today many such Christians, then we are jumping headlong to disaster. One thing and one thing only can stem the tide. If it is the purpose of God to stem it, is for Jesus not to come immediately, but a mighty Holy Spirit-filled conviction on the part of God's people that we have the light and our lives must be a demonstration of it. Great quote. Again, I believe in friendship evangelism. I believe it, it works. I don't believe going out on the streets and cold witnessing works like it used to work in the 70s and the 80s. But I believe we pray like we're doing. We pray for our neighbors. Grace Connection Church exists to equip its members to carry the message of Jesus Christ into their world. We pray for our neighbors. We pray for each other. We serve one another, servant evangelism. We help people. We're, we befriend people. And then we pray and wait for the opportunity for the gospel to be presented. It will come. God will answer that prayer. Those are those prayers that God always answers. He doesn't always answer the prayer about the lottery. But he'll answer prayers about opening up the door to witness. What was that show they had Jim Carrey in it? Was He was God. Remember that show? Anyone remember the name of that? Bruce Almighty. Was that the one? Bruce Almighty? I knew it was one of them. And, um, and so he gets sick of all the prayers coming in. So finally he just answered yes to all of them. And the next day there was like two million people won the lottery. <laughs> they all got like a dollar and a half or something like that because they had to share the, share the gift. No, God doesn't always answer that prayer, but he will answer the prayer when I pray for somebody 
that I, may, that I have the opportunity to give them the gospel. The next thing we learn, number three, I'm going to move quicker, is we reflect his character. We do this with our words and actions. We purpose to reflect who Christ is to our world. It's okay to be weak. I mean, it's okay to be normal. It's okay. We don't have to be super, super Christians, but it's not okay to be mean and mean and weak and critical and weak and neglectful and weak. But the Holy Spirit, Galatians 5.22, produces this kind of fruit in our lives, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control against there is no law against these things. We reflect those things in our culture, in our day, and it becomes attractive to the world. Because, because love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control isn't really in the workplace, is it? It's not in our culture today, is it? Division, schism, critical analysis, insults, judgmental spirits that's what we face in the world but the Christians bring in these fruits with our answers and people begin to see Christ Glenn Evans one of our favorites says the gospel is simply a collection of words terms and phrases all of which are difficult to understand unless it's, they are made clear by somebody's life looking at us the unsaved community shall be able to immediately see a connection between what we are and what the gospel is declaring. This is part of our discipleship. We reflect the character and nature of God. Helping people, standing with people through life events. Standing and understanding people, not judging people. I think one of the most ridiculous things in the world is for the Christians to judge the world and to look at the moral fiber of the day and say, oh, I'm so aghast. What do you expect? With a world that doesn't know Christ, we're the light. We have the light of the Holy Spirit. We have the light of the truth. We have the light of the gospel. He didn't call us to light. He called us to darkness. He didn't call us to make a bright room brighter. He called us to take our light into the darkness and be light in the darkness. So yeah, the world's a screwed up place. It ain't getting any better. Ain't's a real word. It's in the dictionary now. I looked it up. It's not going to get any better. So that's why we, as God's children, need to shine, Philippians 2.15, as lights in a wicked and perverse world. And we do that by not judging, thinking the best, not the worst, speaking kind words, being positive when everyone else is negative. It all points to the face of something's different in us. I remember back in the day when I had a real job, I was working at Innisbrook's um, a sports resort, and I was a waiter there. This is back in the 80s. And I, and I knew it was, a, it was a ministry to me before I went into full-time ministry, like I did shortly thereafter. And um, so I always tried to have the right attitude, and I was friends with everybody. And there was one woman there that was just the sweetest, sweetest woman. Her name was Pat. I won't give you her last name. And she was happily married. And she loved her husband, loved her family. I think her kids are grown. And, um, and she'd go down, and, she would, and we'd be down in the restaurant down there where they fed the employees. We called it the pit. It was actually downstairs. It was a good name for it, the pit, because it was like the pits down there. And, um, and we'd, eat, we'd, eat, we'd eat together and stuff like that. And Pat would talk about what she would do for her husband, what she was making for him for dinner, and how they did this and how they did that. And all the other ladies around her would just start sneering at her. You're just a slave. He takes advantage of you. He da, 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 and they would just start attacking Pat because she loved her husband and served her husband. How she, she, and she was obviously a woman, always had a smile on her face. So finally I'm sitting watching Pat take all this abuse. Finally I looked at all the different people and they were either divorced or they were, wanted to be divorced or they were so unhappy in their marriage. I said, how many of you are remotely content and they just like, I said, then why are you trying to make her discontent? Don't make her like you. You're miserable. She's happy. 
You should be happy for her and not jealous of her. And um, they didn't have a word to say outside of a few four-letter words. But, um, but outside of that, but it was, you see, um, I, I wanted to be a light there. And I, I think Pat was a believer. I, I wanted to see there's something different. We have integrity. That's a big word, my friends. That's a big word. If you're a Christian businessman and you have a fish on your sign or your business card, you better be good to it. If you're not going to be good to it, take the fish off. And just don't tell anyone. If you're not going to warranty your work and back up your work and, um, and be good, true to your word, then take the fish off. Because when you put that fish on there, it says that you're supposed to have integrity. And you're supposed to have honor. Be true to our word, hardworking, become a peacemaker, stay faithful, reliable. They all point to something different. They all point to a life that's different that's being lived through us. See, that's how we reflect the character and nature. And lastly, my friends, this is the last point. We'll be done here soon. We worship him. And I, and I include in that, um, I would include praise in that. That's why I love one of the videos we had and the music videos, which are so powerful. The Passion 2013 video, with, I think that was Standstill. I think that was who that, I forget who that uh, song leader was. And, um, and at the stadium full of people worshiping God. You think that that's noticeable to God? Do you think that God sees that? He absolutely does. Because the scriptures tell us he inhabits the praises of his people. And we know in Malachi 3.16, Colin shared, um, shared this on um, Zoom this weekend, um, on this Tuesday, the last Tuesday night, he, sh he shared that verse, that God, every time we speak of him and we gather together, it's written down in a book of remembrance. The fact you're here today is written down. The fact you're listening online on, 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 and on the webcast is, is written down. When Christ becomes large in my life, when we, when we get a clear vision on the, of the cross, then we see our own sinfulness and we see our own neediness. There is a redeemer. That's why I had that song. You fall into worship as a response. What happened to Isaiah, a godly man, a great Jew who lived a godly life in his day, after Uzziah died and he saw the throne room of God, what happened to him? Fell flat on his face, Isaiah 6, 8. And he says, I am a man with unclean lips. First thing he saw was his sinfulness. When you come into the glory of God, that's the first thing you're going to see is how unworthy you are. Somehow we're not totally convinced of that this side of eternity, but the first time we see Jesus Christ, we're going to see how great his grace was and how dark our sin was, even our white call of sin. Charles Spurgeon said this, the Prince of Preachers, the high thoughts of Christ will enable you to act consistently with our relations towards him. The more loftily we see Christ enthroned, the more lowly we are in bowing before the foot of the throne, the more truly shall we be prepared to act our part towards him. The person of Jesus is the quiet resting place of his people. And when we draw near to him in the breaking of bread and the hearing of the word and the searching of the scriptures, in prayer or praise, we find any form of approach to him to be the return of peace to our spirits. Let's look at these verses, Matthew 8, 28, 9. And they went and Jesus met them and they ran to him. They grasped his feet. What they do? Worshiped him. And when the Roman officer overseeing the execution saw what happened, he worshiped God. This is at the cross. and said, surely this man was innocent. Luke 24, while, while he was blessing them this after the resurrection, he left them, was taken up to heaven. So they worshiped him and then returned to Jerusalem filled with great joy. And they spent all their time in the temple praising God. All their time. You have a home, praise him. You have health, praise him. You have sickness, praise him. <laughs> you have him, praise him. You have salvation, 
Praise him. You can say, I don't have any of that. I don't have a home. I don't have health. (laughs) You have salvation? Praise him. Try. When the church has a passionate free worship and the praise of God, we become attractive to the world. What we saw on that screen today in the worship was attractive. Look at those young people with their hands up praising God. It meant something to them. In a world that doesn't give much value to anything but themselves. If you can, the best you can, don't ever let the majesty of who we are serve a wane in our hearts. So we learn, and this is a learning curve for me to this day, to worship in our daily lives. We let our lives as a disciple go beyond one dimension in word only, but let it become three-dimensional so it's real. As the world sees it, the angels see it, the demons see it, and as we already said, the Lord sees it and is glorified. Father, thank you for these words and thank you for the precious people here. With every head bowed and every eye closed as we do every service on, on, the, on the webcast and um, on Facebook. If you're here today and never asked Christ to be your Savior, in a quiet place of your heart, say, Dear Jesus, today on this, the seventh day of, of, Ju- of June 2020, I ask you to be my Savior. Salvation, as we said earlier, is an event. It's a per- it's, it happens in time. It's not a process. It's an event. When I say yes to Jesus Christ, I may not understand all the gospel. I may not understand everything the Bible um, teaches, but I understand I need a Savior. And I heard today that I can be free from the fear of death. I want that. If Jesus, you can assure my place in heaven, then I want it. Be my Savior. In your own way, your own words, you cried out to God. Let us know. Let me know after church. Let somebody know on the way out the door. Um, FaceTime or or, um, webcast. Let us know that today was your day of eternal life. Jesus... We, we gave a bunch of snapshots this morning, a bunch of pictures of what it means to be a disciple. Help us make, bring it into three dimensions. Help us take these pictures that we hopefully laid out effectively this morning and make it um, clear to us and effective to us and give us a path to follow to take our our discipleship and our lives with you from one dimension to three. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, before we sing, a three-dimension, there it is, three-dimension. Now, what's what's beautiful about this is I have it. (laughs) That's a three-dimensional pizza right there. I can smell it. I can, I'm going to be tasting it after church gonna, because I don't want to get my microphone all greasy or anything like that. But there it is, three dimensions. You can have a snapshot or you can be the real deal. That's our choice.